He played Division I college baseball under the legendary Bobby Richardson of the New York Yankees. He's named the 2013 Business Person of the Year for Atworth, Georgia. He was selected 2018 and 19 top 30 transformational leaders by the John Maxwell Company. He's the voice of Lynch with the Leader Podcast, and I really su suggest that you subscribe to that. He's the senior pastor of the North Star Church in Kennesaw, Georgia, and he's been a friend for many years. I sure love the guy. More than that, he's also been a dynamic friend and a big voice of encouragement in the life of your pastor, Brent. I want you to welcome today for Cascade Hills, give him the best you've got to our friend, Mike Lynch. Well, good morning, everybody. For those of you I've never met, which is almost all of you, my name is Mike, and it's an honor to be here this morning. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for being a church like you are. You are a church that encourages pastors. You're a church that encourages leaders across America that you've never met, but they know of your influence, they know of your pastors. I've had the honor to know Pastor Bill, for many, many years, I grew up in Fayetteville, Georgia, under a guy named Ike Reichard. I know Ike's been here a couple times. Ike and Brother Bill are really good friends. And so then a few years ago, I got to meet him, and he's come and poured into my staff and poured into our community. And he's shown guys like me it's possible to lead a great church, to love a community, and to love your family and do it well. And he has just been a trailblazer that so many guys like me, with it, we've been able to get in behind him and just follow behind him. Would y'all join me today and just thank the Lord for all the investment Pastor Bill's made in this church and in this community through the years. He's been such an encourager, such a friend. And then Pastor Britt. Uh, what great news to pull up Instagram yesterday and to see his health update. He texted me and he called me last night. He's getting better. And man, would y'all just join me and thank the Lord for his healing and boy, him on the mend. And we've gotten to spend some time together. Gosh, when, when crazy COVID happened, we talked all the time about what in the world are we going to do? And so we talked all the time during that season, and it's been fun. And then a few years ago, we got to introduce our families because we both, Pastor Bill and Pastor Brent and their family and my family, we met in uh, Atlanta at a good gospel convention at the Georgia Dome, Kenny Chesney concert, all right? And so we ran into each other at the Kenny Chesney concert downtown, and we got to introduce our families, and it was just such a joy to get to see them in an unexpected place, and uh, to see somebody safe in Atlanta is always a positive thing, all right? And so um, let me tell you a little bit about me. My family didn't get to come with me today, so it's wedding bell season around the Lynch household. Uh, I have, I've been married 30 years coming up this year to my beautiful wife, Ann, and we've been at the same church now going on 25 years. So this is my wife, Ann. We met at Liberty University up in Virginia, and uh, man, she is just she is just amazing. No, I did not rob the cradle. We're, she's one year younger. Don't judge me. We didn't age the same, all right? And so that's, that's my wife, Ann, just an amazing lady. And this is my son, Casey. Casey is our high school pastor. He's 27 at North Star. His fiance, Kelsey, they just got engaged a few weeks ago. My daughter, Mary Michael, serves as a community uh, director at a great church up in Winder, Georgia. And uh, her fiance, Jen. And so it's so neat to be in the season of life now to see your kids growing up. I mean, they're growing up. And I mean, I'm 29. I don't know how they do it. But anyway, so they're, they're growing up. And this summer, we got to do the first ever. We all went on vacation with a, with a house in Hilton Head. We we're all able to spread out there. And we all went to Hilton Head and spent a week together. And it was neat to see your children meet their mates and their mates make them better. They're great kids, but their mates make them better. But I did learn something for all the parents in the room. I have one, two, three, four, four full-time employed adults, and I paid for every dinner. I don't know how that works, but somehow you get stuck with the bill. I'm like, you know, it's okay to pop off a little money here, buddy. So if you're a single or college student, get, 
buy your parents dinner occasionally, all right? So do it a little bit. All right, I want you to do me a favor tonight. I want you to take your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 13 this morning. Acts chapter 13. We're going to continue this series in the life of David. If you have got a way to take notes, you got a notebook this morning, you want to scribble down some notes, that'll be great. If you want to look on the seat back in front of you, you can connect to the app. All the notes are in the app. Because today we're going to talk about a word that hits all of our lives. It's a word that no matter if you're 13 or 30 or 30 or 60, this word plays a part in your life. See, we all know David for killing, so we're going to do a little pop quiz this morning, right? So we all know David for killing a giant named who? Goliath, right? You've been in a series on David. You're building up to the giant. We know that David just sort of burst on the scene, right, as a teenager. The prophet was tapped by God and said, listen, King Saul was never my king. King Saul's heart is far from me. You've got to go find a new king. And I want you to go to Jesse's house. And in Jesse's house, you're going to find one of Jesse's boys. And he's going to be the next king. So He shows up at Jesse's house, and Jesse does the parade, right? He brings out all his boys, from oldest to youngest, from Eliab the oldest, the the six-foot-four, five-tool, five-star-looking quarterback, right? The guy who looks like a king. And we find that the prophet goes, no, he's not the one, he's not the one, he's not the one. Do you have any other kids? And you remember remember his dad said, well, I do have one. He's just a shepherd. He's out tending the fields. And he brings him in. You remember, he walks in and he said, surely you're the Lord's anointed. And remember the scriptures in 1 Samuel. For the Lord does not look at the outward appearance, for he looks at the what? Heart. He looks at the heart. And David's got a heart I can use. David, yeah, he doesn't look the part. He doesn't look like a king yet. He doesn't act like a king. I mean, he's a teenager. He's ruddy. He's handsome. But he's, he's a kid. But he's the one that I'm going to use. And we begin to watch David's life. And here's what we know about David's life. David's life gives us all hope. That's why I'm glad God left it in Scripture. Because David has some really, really good days. <laughs> David has some really, really bad days, right? David has some high moments where he does it all right. And David has some low moments where he can't do anything right. David has moments that he trusted God with all his heart. And David had moments where he questioned God with the pit of his soul. But yet we find this verse at the end of, of David's life. Not, not like at his memorial service, not at his funeral, not written by one of his children, but said by God himself through Luke, who wrote the book of Acts. He leaves us this verse, and it hits where we all live today. Would y'all stand with me this morning in honor of reading God's word together? We're going to look at one verse today. We're going to camp out on one. I love, I love how Luke captures this. He says this, after David had done the what? What is that word? Will. If I were to go across this room, anybody in here would say, you know, at the end of my days, I want to live out the purpose God created me for. I want to live out exactly why God knit me together like he did. I don't want to miss anything. Listen, David after his highs, David after his lows. David after his goods, and David after his bads. After David had done the will of God in his own generation, he died, and he was buried with his ancestors, and his body decayed. One version says it this way. After after David had served God's purpose in his generation, he was done. Can you imagine living your life in such a way that God would say about you, they did everything I created them to do? Not a a friend saying that. Not a family member saying that. 
Not a coworker saying that. But your creator, the one who knit you together, the one who laid out the map of your life, he looks back at your life and says, yep, David was my boy. And David did exactly what I asked him to do. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to talk about how to live out the purpose that God created each of us for. So would you pray with me? Right where you're standing this morning. Would you say, God, would you speak to my soul this morning? Would you say that? You may attend Cascade Hills and you're here every Sunday. That's awesome. But boy, we all need a fresh word from the Lord, don't we? Would you ask the Lord to do that for you today? Maybe today's your first day. You came with a friend. You're like, Mike, I'm not even sure if there's a, even a God out there. He even knows my name. Would, would you ask him to speak to you, show you? Would you? And then secondly, would you tell him, God, when you speak, I'll listen. Would you? Father, I, I don't know specifically how you do this, but I've sure seen you do it. God, would you show up in this room this morning? Would you show up in the places and the spaces that people are watching from this morning? And God, would you pull up a chair across from us? God, we don't want to hear the words from a guy from northwest Atlanta. God, we came to hear your word and your truth, and your heart. So God, speak to us, teach us, and when at the end of the day we leave these doors and we leave this place that we're watching from this morning, we will know beyond a shadow of a doubt we have met with you. So God, speak to us and do your thing now, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Before you're seated, turn around, find somebody around you, tell them who you are, tell them your name, and tell them if your team won or lost yesterday. Would you do that real quick? You guys do that real quick. All right, after you do that, you can be seated. So, if you're a Vandy fan, I'm very sorry. All right, we'll have a prayer service for you later. I'm a Georgia Tech fan. Any other Tech fans in the room? Okay, there we go. All right, and so I guess it just happens in Atlanta. We won last night. It's a big night. I'm very happy this morning. The Braves won. I stayed up and watched the Braves. All right, it's a big deal there in Cobb County, and then they won. That really has nothing to do with what we're talking about. But anyways, all right, so let's talk about this. How in the world do we live a life that's not a wasted life? So this past year, I turned 52. That's crazy, man. 52. I'm at that point, this is our 25th year, we'll celebrate 25 years since we planted our church in January. I was doing a series at North Star and, and I, I put my age into an app and I was going to show it on the screen where it says approximate number of days you live, you put in your height, you put in your weight, you put in all that stuff, it shows you the approximate kind of thing and then it shows you a circle of how many days you have left and I had like this much and I'm like, I don't like that illustration, all right? And so I got rid of that because I started to learn I don't have as many days to waste as I used to, all right? The Bible says this, that life is like a vapor. It's here one minute, it's gone the next. So I gotta take, a, I gotta take advantage of what I got. I gotta take advantage of this season of life whether I'm 19 or 29. I can't waste a day. See, long before David killed Goliath, David defeated the giant of a wasted life. David didn't waste the life that God gave him. David took advantage of the life that God gave him. David said, I'm going to take what God's given me, and I'm going to use it. And here's the great news. The great news is David wasn't perfect. There's only been one that's been perfect. And his name was Jesus. He's the only one that's been perfect. Everybody else, you see their flaws, don't you? David's story should encourage you. Because David, David didn't always 
do it all right, but yet at the end of his days, David didn't waste his life. How in the world can we learn what David learned? See, here's what I love. All right, time out real quick. Here's what I love about the Bible. God didn't sanitize the Bible for you. That's what I love about it. See, if, if Mike had been in charge of the Bible, then I would have taken out a lot of the stories that you're going, why in the world did they leave that in there, right? And so I would have sanitized it. I'd cleaned it up, put some exclamation points on it and made it happier. And, but God left all the junk. David wrote 70 plus of the 150 Psalms and many of those begin with, God, have you forgotten me? God, where are you? God, do you not know my name? God, I'm in a cave. Everybody hates me. Everybody's trying to kill me. Blah, blah, blah. He's saying all this stuff. God didn't take any of that out because that's a real journey. But yet at the end of his days, David didn't waste any of them. So what did David do that you and I can do in Columbus, Georgia, on a Sunday morning in September of 2021, living in the craziest time we've ever seen in our lifetime. What did David learn? Three things, really, really simple this morning. So your pen, pencil, lipstick, mascara, you got something to write with, I want you to write down a couple thoughts this morning. Number one, David looked in and he knew this, God made me unique. You know, you read that verse, and it's easy to read. We just read it. But when this New Testament apostle wrote about this king from years before, he said this, David. I want you to write, if you're taking notes this morning, I want you to write this little thought down. God's got a story and a journey with my name on it, too. It didn't say a king from the Old Testament. It didn't say one of my vast number of servants. Do you know that God knows everything about you? Did you know that? Psalm 139 teaches, he knows the number of hairs on our head. For some of us, he's been able to quit counting. But anyway, so he knows the number of hairs on our head. It says that he knows all the days that we're going to live before we ever lived one of them. He knows the words that are on our lips before they're ever spoken. He hems you in behind and before. You are special and unique to him. In fact, the psalm says this, listen. If he were to number the thoughts that God has of you every day, it would outnumber the grains of sand. You ever been to the beach and gotten sand in your car or in your shoes or other unmentionable places, right? That's lots of sand, right? The only way that the psalmist could compare it was that's how much God thinks about you. Why? You're unique. There's nobody like you. God created you with gifts, abilities, and a story, and a past, and talents that nobody else has. So you should think about David. Here's David. God could have gotten a king. All right, listen. When you're God, you can about do anything you want to. Can we all agree with on that? All right, and so God could have gotten a king from king training school, right? He could have gone to the military going, one day we're going to have to feed, uh, defeat a Philistine giant, so I'm going to go find a guy that's trained militarily. He didn't do that. He could have gone and found somebody that may have been a better speaker or more respected or taller or bigger. He didn't. He took David, a shepherd boy, who knew what it was like to lead. So, y'all help me out. Another pop quiz. Shepherds led what? Sheep. What are the dumbest animals on the face of the earth? What are they? Sheep. Because David one day was going to have to lead people, and people aren't far behind the sheep. All right? And so David, David learned in obscurity how to lead, not how we would have drawn it up. There wasn't a piece of David's life God didn't use. If you're taking notes and you forget everything else I say this morning, here's the line I want you to remember. God never wastes your time, and he never wastes your experiences, ever. Nothing that's happened in your life is going to go wasted. 
He's going to use all of it to make you unique. David was unique, and he was used uniquely, and so will you if you let the Lord use you. But the Lord's too good to make you be used. He's going to let you have that opportunity to say yes or no. God, I want you to use me. I want you to use my life. I don't want to waste it. I don't want at the end of my days to look back with regret and go, why didn't I, why didn't I take advantage of that place? Why didn't I take advantage of that season? Why didn't I take advantage of that time? It's like raising kids, right? I never dreamed there would be a day my children would be out of my house. Oh, we're in travel ball, cheerleading. I mean, those days got long. But they went quick. Can't waste those days. God makes you unique. How many of you are parents and you have more than one child? Raise your hand. If you're a parent, you have more than one child, okay? How many of you would say, Our, my children are different? Raise your hand, all right? Some of you want to put up both hands. Dear Jesus, all right? And so they're very different, right? Very different. So I remember I had been a youth pastor five and a half years, and I had done lessons for parents as a youth pastor without kids about 10 surefire things you want to do for your kids to raise them godly. And then I brought one home and went, oh, dear Lord. All right, I have no idea what I've been talking about all these years. And so, but our firstborn, Casey, sensitive, uh, pretty obedient. And I remember Casey's two, three-ish. I could bend down and look at him and say, Casey, when you did this, that disappointed me. I don't want you to do that again. Do you understand me? And this big tear would leave his eyes and roll down his cheek. And I'm like, this parenting thing is easy. And then God blessed us with Mary Michael. All right, and so we brought Mary Michael home from the hospital. And I'm like, well, we're going to do exactly what we did with Casey. And it'll work great. And I remember Mary Michael's three-ish somewhere in there, and she did something one day, so I'm going to do what worked on Casey. And I said, Mary Michael, I just want you to know, I'm very disappointed in you. And I remember her little green eyes, little beady eyes looking back at me and said, Dad, I'm very disappointed in you. All right? And I'm like, okay, I don't know what I do next, right? God made them unique. He didn't make Mary Michael and Casey like each other. God didn't make you like anybody else you. Let me ask you a question. If you don't live your story, who's going to live it? If you don't live what God created you to be, somebody else is missing out. So let me let you in on a little secret. Your story isn't for you. Your story is for somebody else. If God's only purpose in our lives was for us to know him, that was the only purpose, the day you asked Jesus in your heart, he'd have taken you home. But he left you here. Why did he leave you here? For somebody else. And if you don't live out your story, somebody's going to miss you think about, we live in a world of comparison, don't we? We live in a world that, that tries to fit us in a mold, to try to fit us in a box. Everybody's got to look alike, dress alike, act alike. God didn't create you to be like anybody else. He created you to be you. And I'll tell you this, and I told the crowd last night, it took me years in ministry to figure out who I was and to lead uniquely. Like he equipped me. Not like he equipped my buddy down the street or like he equipped my pastor growing up or, or Pastor Bill or Pastor Brent. He created me unique with unique. And I had a background in baseball and athletics. And I have a love of it. If I wasn't doing what I do, that's what I would be doing. So how does he use my story in that world? And we'll talk about it here in a second. God created us unique. But the second thing David did is David looked up. God gives me purpose. You could say it, this is the way the business people would say it, Simon Sinek would say it, God gives us all a why. It's not what we do, it's why we do what we do. Not everybody in this room needs to serve full time on a church staff. But God's given you purpose in what you do. God's given you purpose that in the morning when you get out of bed, you got a reason to live out the journey, to live out the skills and the gifts and the talents that God's given you. I love how this said, after he had done 
the will of God. Meaning, after he said, God, use me in the space and the place that you've put me, David went home. But boy, he didn't miss his season. So Pastor Bill talked about a a baseball coach that I played for. I played for a gentleman named Bobby Richardson. He was with the New York Yankees from 58 to 66. I did not watch him. I was born in 69. I did not see him play. But boy, when he called my house that day, my daddy's like, oh yeah, you call him back. I remember him well. He played with Mickey Mantle and Moose Skyron and Tony Kubek and and, uh, Yogi Berra. Oh, I mean, he played with the greats. And I did ask him, all right, this is a whole sort of off subject. And I said, was Yogi Berra as funny as people make him out to be? And he said, they don't even capture the things that Yogi would do. Yogi called one time at a hotel. He said, I need to order a large pizza. And they said, it comes in eight slices or we can cut it in 12 slices. And Yogi said, better make it eight. I don't think I can eat 12. All right. And so that, anyways, that'll sit on you later. But anyway, so Coach Richardson played on the Yankees during that generation. Had a great career, great career. But his mission wasn't to be known as just a gold glove winner, which he was, or a multi-year World Series winner, which he was. He wanted to make a mark for Jesus while he was there. In fact, in the baseball world, the very first baseball chapel ever done was on Bobby Richardson Day, the year he retired in New York. And a guy came in and presented the gospel to the Yankee team. Nobody that day said anything. But years later on a hospital bed in Dallas, Texas, coach gets a call from Mickey Mantle. He said, Bobby, I've been given X number of days and I need you to come see me. Coach Richardson got on a plane in Sumter, South Carolina, flew to Dallas, Texas, and sat in Mickey Mantle's, probably the greatest baseball player of all time, sat in Mickey Mantle's hospital room and led him to Christ. Why? Because when he played, he had a purpose that wasn't baseball. Baseball was the what, but he had a bigger why. Can I ask you a question today? What's your why? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? Is it to just make a living? Is it just to earn a paycheck? Is it just to clock in, clock out? Or has God called you to something bigger? Has God called you to something nobody else can do but you? And listen, the world may never know your name, and that's okay. But whoever God created you for will. I did a funeral a few years ago for a a lady that attended our church. She was an older lady. and At this point, she's in her late 80s, early 90s. Nobody knew who she was. She sat in the crowd every week and sat with his family. I, I thought that was this guy's mom. It wasn't his mom. His parents had abandoned him, and she was his babysitter growing up in the little neighborhood. She kept kids, and his parents said, we can't take care of him. She took him in as her own, and she raised him. I didn't know that. And now at the end of her life, she's living with this. He basically adopted her as his mom. I show up to do this funeral, and, and this guy, Michael, Michael goes, Mike, you're going to be blown away when you see what happens when you walk in that room. So I walk in, and he said, I want you to ask this question. If Miss Ann was the lady's name, if Miss Ann changed the direction of your life and loved you like you needed to be loved in that childhood season of life, he said, I want you to ask anybody in the room to stand. And I said, Michael, my fear of asking that question is, what if nobody stands? How awkward would that be? He goes, oh, I promise you they will. I asked that question in a packed little chapel at Winkenhofer Funeral Home in Kennesaw, Georgia. Packed room. And I'm going to be, preachers, we can tend to over-exaggerate numbers. But anyways, at least 30 people in that room stood up. Principals, teachers business leaders, lawyers, all who had gone through her home while she took care of kids. And she had poured love and Jesus into every one of them. 
she had done the will of God in her generation. And you've never heard her name, but they'll never forget her. I think sometimes we, we think, well, then to do this, I've got to be this. No, 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 no. You just got to leave your yes on the table. And when God taps you on the shoulder, you got to be willing to go, God, I'm willing. I'm willing. I'm willing to do whatever you ask me to do. Years ago, I was a student pastor five and a half years before I, we planted North Star and I took uh, one of the kids that had grown up in my ministry. He's off in college now and we've started North Star. I've sort of lost touch with him and he called me. He said, Mike, I'm going to Brazil. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, I'm going. I'm taking a year off college. I'm going to Brazil and I'm going to do mission work and blah, blah, blah. He tells me all this stuff. I'm like, man, Jeffrey, that's amazing. So we're sitting over lunch and I never dreamed this kid would ever leave the state of Georgia, let alone go overseas, let alone be more than five minutes from a mall where he could go hang out and, and do stuff like he did when he was in high school. And so I, it's just blowing my mind. And we're sitting there at lunch and I said, how did it happen? And he said, I was at this conference and this lady, this missionary spoke and she said, I followed God's call because I wrote on a card, yes, I put it on the table and whenever God taps my shoulder and I know that it's him, my answer is always yes. It's not, well, I'm not equipped or I'm not good enough or I'm not smart enough, or I'm not bright enough, or I'm not all these things. My answer is yes. And he said, Mike, I put my yes on the table. God opened the door, and I'm going. I'm like, Jeffrey, that's, a, that's amazing. And he said, can I ask you a question? I said, well, sure. He said, is your yes on the table? I went, well, that's none of your business, all right? And that's none of your business. I'm buying lunch, right? Because all of a sudden, we live in seasons where our yes is a yes. But then as uh, we get smarter, we want to weigh it out a little bit. I don't know if I really, I, I could do that. Let me give you a for instance. I want you to live for Jesus in your workplace. Well, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know if I know enough of the Bible. I, I, I. People that do the will of God in their generation aren't any brighter or smarter than any of us. They're just more obedient. They're just people that are willing to say, God, whatever you have for me, my answer is yes. All right, can we call time out? Let's, let's, we, well, I didn't do this last night, so I feel led to do this this morning. We live in a world that needs Jesus now more than ever. Would y'all agree with that? It scares me the world we're growing up, our kids are growing up in. We're finishing a series at my church this morning called The Birth of a Movement out of the Book of Acts. You know how movements end? When people stop leading the way. We sit here today because of 11 apostles, act, or disciples, became the apostles in the book of Acts and about 120 followers who just said, I saw a resurrected Savior, and I'm going to tell you what. He's got my life. That's why we sit in here. 120 people. Really began with 11. Judas had gone away and done his thing. And then those 11 said, let me tell you something. I saw him. I saw him die on Friday. You go to a funeral on Friday and bump into somebody at Publix that you were at the funeral for on Sunday, it'll get your attention, right? And so it got their attention. And they're like, man, I saw the resurrected Savior. And these cowards... Start of the movement. Why? They found their purpose. Their purpose wasn't them anymore. Their purpose was somebody else who didn't know the story. That's why all but one of them were killed for their faith. Because they wouldn't stop talking about. Remember, the Acts says, who are these uneducated men? They won't stop speaking and talking about this resurrected Savior. They found their purpose. Let me tell you something. You find your purpose, it'll change your life. Gives you a reason to get out of bed in the morning. Number three, look around. God places me strategically in his own generation. David didn't come 200 years before. He didn't come 200 years after. David came right when God needed him. Ladies and gentlemen, there are no accidents with God. Y'all do know that, right? 
God doesn't look down, down and go, oh my goodness, I didn't know this was going on. You don't know that in Arkansas, there's not a mom or a grandma praying for their grandson or granddaughter that moved to Columbus, Georgia. And praying they would connect their heart with Jesus. And you just happen to move, they just happen to move next door to you. They just happen to serve you at the police force. They just happen to be in the locker down the hall. You aren't where you are by accident. When I showed up in Kennesaw, Georgia 30 years ago as a student pastor, I never intended to still be living there. I thought I was on the fast track to success. But God put me there to plant my life for a reason bigger than me. Aren't you thankful that years ago God called Pastor Bill Purvis to this church? strategic he didn't know that the first Sunday he came here in view of a call he was just being obedient to the Lord but he served his generation well hasn't he how many of you would say if it weren't for this church I don't know where I would be would you raise your hand what would happen what happens when we miss it we lose and others lose. We get to the end of our life and we're like, man, I wasted it. I've got so many regrets. I've got so many things I wish I could do different. God put you in the space and the place that he put you, as Esther said, for such a time as this. For such a time as this. You know what he's looking for? It's people to be obedient. What could happen in Columbus, Georgia? What could happen in Kennesaw and Ackworth, Georgia, if a group of people said, God, like the apostles did, just use me. I'm yours. I'm, I'm your vessel. You just use me. Every how you want to use me. Change our world. You meet people that get up on purpose every day. So Ann and I, my wife and I, we talk about this a lot. I wonder sometimes what the ultimate purpose God created me for. I do wonder that. Was it to be a pastor? To be a leader in our community, I coach in our community, I'm a baseball coach in our community at a high school or a football chaplain or the work I do with business leaders, whatever it is. Is that why he created me? Or maybe did he create me for these people? Maybe the purpose he created me for was to love my wife with the love of Christ and to pour into my children who are going to stand on my shoulders and do greater things than I've ever done. See, we may feel like our purpose will make us a worldwide name. Ladies and gentlemen, our job is not to get our name known. Our job is to make his name known. That's our job. Can I ask you a question today? Is your yes on the table? Well, Mike, I, I go to church every weekend. That's not what I'm asking. I'm asking if your yes is on the table. I'm asking if you are living out the purpose he created you for. Maybe, just maybe, you walked in this room today and you went, Mike, I never even knew God knew my name. He does. He so knew your name. That 2,000 years ago, he sent his son named Jesus to die on a cross for you. Why? Because he wants you to be with him in heaven. You can't get there without him. And maybe today God brought you here to find your purpose, which is to know him first. We can't find our earthly purpose until we know Jesus. Can we all agree with that? You can't. You just can't. It doesn't make any sense. It's like it brings the clarity. Maybe today you need to meet him. We're called to know him, and we're called to make him known.
pray with me? Father, this is a sacred place this morning. Anytime your people do business with you, it's a holy moment. Maybe you're watching, maybe you're listening, maybe you're sitting in this room today. And you say, Mike, honest to goodness, I never knew God knew who I was. Let alone knew everything about me and loved me at my worst. Mike, today I want to meet Jesus. I want to know Jesus. Man, could I, it's your first purpose. Could I introduce you to him? What an honor it would be. It's not the words of this prayer. It's really the cry of our heart. It goes like this. Dear Lord Jesus, would you pray this with me? Dear Lord Jesus, I need you. I believe you lived for me. And I believe you died for me my sins and I believe you rose again just for me come into my heart Lord Jesus and be my personal Lord and Savior today boy if you ask Jesus in your heart welcome home welcome home you're why this church exists welcome home in the quietness of this room, if you say, Mike, today for the very first time, I ask Christ in my life. Would you just slip your hand up right where you are today? Would you just slip it up? Amen. Slip it up. Awesome. Just a moment, and this group begins to sing. Well, we've got folks down front. Come tell them the decision that you made. Make it public. and Let somebody know. They're going to give you a time to just walk down and go on these amazing Cascade Hills team. It's going to meet you down here. Maybe, though, today you're like, Mike, I know Jesus, but I'm not living out the purpose to make him known. I just don't know, man. I, I'm living, but I'm wasting some of my life, and I don't want to waste any more life. If that's you this morning, would you just slip your hand up? Mike, I don't know if I'm living out the purpose God created me for. You may want to sit at your seat where you are. You may want to come down here and kneel and pray. Here's my challenge. Don't leave here today wasting another day. Let's live out the life he created us for. Would you stand with me? Father, today we give our worship to you. We give our lives to you. And Father, today we say use us for your kingdom. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. If this ministry or this message has touched your life in any way, please send us your story to I am at CascadeHills.com. Now, if you'd like to financially support this ministry as it continues to spread the word of Jesus Christ around the globe, you can go to our website, CascadeHills.com, or download our free mobile app and click on the Give button. We invite you to check out some of our other messages or tune in live every weekend, Saturdays at 4 or 6 p.m. or Sunday mornings at 9 and 11 a.m. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great day.